Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today, we have Chris Vermeulen of the Technical Traders on the show. Chris is a technical analyst, and we're going to pick his brain on our favorite commodities and the companies you submitted. Chris, thank you for coming back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. Pleasure. Ah, the pleasure's all on this side of the table, sir. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and give us about a, a minute or two on what you guys do over at the Technical Traders. Sure. Uh, high level view is we focus strictly on the charts, on price action, technical analysis, hence the name, the Technical Traders. Uh, more or less, we don't take any news, economic data, Fed, interest rates, you name it. Any of that stuff is completely uh, eliminated from our analysis. As investors, we want our share price or our invest, investments to go up in value. Uh, and if that investment is not going up in value, we don't want to own it. We can get back into it later. So we rotate our capital, reinvest our money only into assets going up. Could be stocks, could be commodities, could be currencies, uh, bonds, whatever it, it may be at the time. And that's what we do. We just follow price. We manage our positions. And the key is to always be holding something going up, even if it's just a cash account earning daily interest. That is better than losing money. Awesome. Awesome. OK, um, let's see. Let's let's hit the first uh, question real quick. Uh, Boyan wants to know, uh, he says, thank you for taking our questions. He says, which technical indicators does Chris like to use? Uh, technical indicators. Well, uh, let me share my chart real quick. I can show you kind of a, just the bait. I, I really use pretty basic analysis. I do have some, uh, several of my own proprietary analysis, but let's just take a look at the SP 500 daily chart. I really do like the, um, three moving averages, which is the blue one here, which is the 50 day, uh, exponential moving average. I like the 20 day, which is the pink line. And I like the five day. And each of them kind of represent a bit a different cycle, a different time frame, a different style of trading or trader who's usually involved in the markets. Typically, if you're in a strong trend, um, we you know the price will hold at or above the five day, and then when it, it breaks through there, it usually finds support around the twenty day. Uh, I find the five day is like a momentum trading kind of strategy. Yeah. Uh, the pink is like swing trading, and then the fifty day. I don't really trade the fifty day at all. But it's nice to know that the underlying longer term trend is up. And one of the reasons why I really like these is I like the five day moving average when the five day and price of the stock or ETF is a, is above the 20 day, the pink line. That's when you usually have a signal that you are in a uh, an uptrend and you get these really nice trends. Uh, it really helps you identify when the market rolls over and goes down. And uh, sometimes you do obviously get noise, but it really does help you trade with the underlying trend. If the five days is, is above the 20 day and, and they're sloping up, you're usually in a good market. You want to be focusing on owning stocks uh, versus trying to bet against the market. Um, other than that, I mean, the rest, I, I do look at different indexes. I do look at, um, I like to look at the Russell 2000. I like to see if money wants to go into the small cap growth stocks. I like to see if people are rotating into gold or miners. Um, what about the dollar? The rest really comes down to intermarket analysis, and which is, you know, money ro is rotating from one asset to another. If it's coming out of, if the stock market's going down, we want to know where that is going. And where that money goes kind of tells us the mindset and the level of panic or so in the investor's mind. So I like to see you know, which sectors and commodities are moving up while other things are moving down. And that kind of gives me my gauge, but uh, really comes down to just following the trends and identifying when we're in an uptrend, when you should get long and, and managing those positions. Okay. So you use the exponential moving averages, not the simple moving averages? Uh, for for long-term moving average, like 150 day, I like the 150 day. Uh, okay. If it's sloping up prices above it, you're generally in a bullish market. Um, but uh, the longer term ones, I sometimes will, will chart both the simple and the exponential and just see where they are. Because when you get to these longer time frames, they're not as sensitive here as these short ones where price can tag it and bounce off it the same day or the next day. Yeah. Long term, you can get the, the price moving through the 150 day or 200 day moving average for a week or two, and then it comes back up. So I usually will chart both of the those moving averages just to give me the range where it should find some support. 
because uh, again, that's year old data, 200 day, 150 day moving average. It's old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, while you got the uh, S and P up, uh, last time we had you on, uh, you uh, forecasted that we're going to move to all time highs. Uh, that happened. Uh, what, what do you see going on with the S and P uh, in the in the future here? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're in a strong uptrend. We're along this market. We've been long the market since uh, November, but um, I do believe we are going to see a big market correction once this this wave kind of fizzles out. Uh, if we were to look at the the seasonality of the SP 500, typically we see the market want to push higher into May or June, July, mm -hmm. somewhere in here, the market tops out. In fact, the seasonality chart of, of what happens on average each year, if you were to look at last year's price action of just the SP 500, it's, it's pretty much identical to this price action. So I believe right now, uh, when you and I talked, I, I talked about how I think the SP 500, the NASDAQ were likely to hit new all-time highs. Mm -hmm. it's going to become headline news and anybody who's not in the market, meaning they were too scared to get in and they missed out on the rally, they're going to get sucked into the market. We're starting to see that right now. Yeah. The other thing is people who don't really know anything about the markets are starting to pile in and buy Nvidia. And that is another red flag. And, and these indexes hitting these new all time highs is the market's way of saying, Hey, if you're not in, you better get in. And it's going to suck everybody in to buy near the top and I believe come May, when it's like buy, you know, you sell in May and go away is the saying, I think we could start to see some very big heavy selling, distribution selling, meaning big selling days with heavy volume, everything goes down. We actually saw this uh, about a week and a half ago in the market. We had one day where somebody huge was unloading everything. And we're going to start to probably see more of those you know, late this spring, early in the summer. And if we see more of those, that to me will be a, one of the last major flag saying, Hey, this market is now getting sold into, I think the last of the retail investors have got sucked in. Yeah. They all now own at the highs and we're, you know, it's time to get out. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you see general upside in the market until uh, probably uh, May, June. And then after that, uh, probably rolling over. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about the dollar, the DXY? Yeah, the dollar, it's it's building a base. You know, when we look at it over the past uh, really two years, I believe the dollar is going to do very well. It's been kind of carving out this kind of rounding base here. I think there's still quite a bit of work to be done, but uh, I do believe we're eventually going to see the dollar break out of here and start a big move up if the economy goes into a recession and we we see a bear market take place. Uh, we've seen this in the past. Whenever we the stock market or the economy goes into uh a big downtrend, the US dollar does very well. In 2022, the US dollar was one of the best plays. We played it to the long side. It's a slow moving, low volatility play, which is amazing because um, the markets are super violent and stressful. And this allows you to just go into something that moves very slow. Uh, you know, the, the dollar had a, you know, 17, 18% move. The pullbacks in them really are only like three, 4%. So it's super easy to digest a really nice trend. And so I am bullish on the dollar um, once we, we start to break up here. And I feel like it's going to, the timing could come out where the stock market starts to top out in May. The dollar will also just be starting to break out here or, or turn up uh, and, and start a, a new rally in May. Uh, so they're going to go in opposite direction. So I like the dollar. Okay. So you, you see when the S and P, when the market starts to uh, roll over, the dollar is going to get stronger. Yeah. And, and just to quickly look at the big picture here, if we were to zoom back on the dollar and go back to uh, the dot, the dot com, the last tech bubble we had, which I believe were actually very similar scenario, the dollar moves up very strong. And then once we have that bear market, uh, we'll see uh, the dollar um, sell off and that'll be a catalyst to send a lot of commodities a lot higher. Uh, so my, my, my thinking is we're going to eventually see the dollar break out and run and have another very big move. Um, going forward. So I'm bullish on it over the next uh, year or so. Oh, okay. Maybe I misunderstood. I I, I thought uh, you're saying that it's it's going to run until um, uh, until the, well, let's see. Okay. So when the I, I believe I believe when the stock market tops in May, mm -hmm. the dollar will take off. Market goes down, stocks, uh, stocks go down, the dollar goes up. <laughs> dollar goes up. Okay. 
Okay, because it, the dollar becomes uh, stronger and it takes some of the safe haven dollars. defensive play, and yeah, everybody seems to flock towards the dollar as the you know the global reserve currency. It just yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. How about uh, gold? What uh, what do you see in the gold chart? I I like gold a lot. It's it's been holding its value. It's flirting right up close to new all time highs. You know, I've always liked gold more than silver, simply from an investor standpoint. Um, in terms of volatility, it's very slow moving. Uh, people put a lot of money into it. People who buy gold tend to just buy it and hold it. Um, so it's it's fairly stable. Um, I think you know if the dollar does start to rally later this year uh, and we go into a bear market. The bear market will pull gold down. We tend to see liquidation, margin calls. Uh, people just start to sell everything when they get nervous. And we always tend to see gold, silver, and miners go down. Uh, so, And to add to that, the dollar will probably be rocketing higher. And a rising dollar hurts gold. So I like gold. I think long-term over the next three, four, five years, I think gold is going to be substantially higher up in the 3,000 range. Um but I, I think it's going to be fairly choppy for the next six, eight, 12 months uh, because it might have a pullback with the overall broad market. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And if you zoom out on that, maybe go to the weekly or the monthly and uh, do you, uh, do you see, Oh, that's far enough, I guess. Um, oh, the, yeah. um, <clears throat> uh, the cup and handle pattern are, are, are you, uh, do you see that or. Yeah, there's definitely a big, you can say there's a huge cup and handle pattern, which is a very, very bullish sign. The, one of the general rules that I, I learned in uh, John Murphy's technical analysis book years ago is kind of the, the depth of the cup, whatever this depth is, if it is a, a, a true cup and handle, you can stack it on top uh, three to four times. So, you know, we'd be looking, you know, way up here for gold. So this is a massive, like, huge potential pattern. Like, I don't want to get into like five, $6,000 gold. Uh, I think 27, 2600 is the next target. And then from there we recalculate, recalibrate things. Uh, but yeah, there's a huge pattern here that we could go into a decade long sell-off in the dollar and who knows what's going to go on with crypto and, and all that stuff. And for all we know, people are going to fall back to physical metals or gold and silver, and it becomes the the hottest thing ever again. Yeah, yeah, a lot of central banks are buying it since we sanctioned Russia, and uh, I think they're using that as currency instead of uh, some of the other random yeah. ones. Yeah. So you, you've you've heard that the cup and handle pattern. I, I I've heard the same on the retracement. There, you take the bottom of the cup to the to the top right of it, and uh, but you're saying that can do it three or four times, right? You're saying like from here? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's roughly the same. I I drew the line just from this high, kind of through this noise. Okay. Uh, give or give or take. I mean, it's there's it's a fine art. What's right and wrong, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty much all the same. Uh, usually, the depth of a of a consolidation will be the next upside target. So, for example, we could we could even just zoom in and 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 just go from this range here of this this pattern. If we take that and just stack it up, that actually brings us to the 2600, which is what Fibonacci analysis actually gives us as well as 26, 2700. So there's a bunch of different layers on, you know, you kind of build your chart going forward. And I, I like to chart a whole bunch of ways and see where all these levels are, but uh, there's a lot of potential with a, a cup and handle pattern, especially when renting what I think is a huge, huge super cycle uh, going forward. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, a couple of listener questions. Ahmed and 369 want to know about Newmont. All right. Gold stocks have just been beat up. They, I mean, Newmont is way back down here to uh, lows we saw back in 2019. Um, I mean, there's just no love in this space. We can go way back in time. I think Newmont has gone like nowhere. Yeah, just a really long, big, volatile space. I don't know what their dividend is. They started paying dividends back in 2000. So, you know, the only consistent income you've got here is, is dividend. The rest is it's been more or less a wasted 20. <laughs> yeah, you could argue it's a wasted 40 years. It's right back to where it was 40 years ago. Um, so I, I'm not a fan of really noisy charts like this. I like to be in, in spaces that have strong trends and strong moves. 
Um, and the precious metal space is great when we're in a super cycle, a massive uh, move to the upside, but we're not in one yet. And when you're not in one, the precious metal space is, is just like this. It's volatile. Most gold miners are struggling like this. Uh, they're sold off and they, there's, they're very difficult to trade simply because sometimes they move with the market and then they'll disconnect and they'll move the opposite of the market. And you never know when that disconnect is. And if you try and time it and trade them, you generally end up holding a whole bunch of gold miners for many years and they're all underwater. Uh, it, they're, they're just, they're way harder than people think. Just like me, I got sucked into them years ago in the tech bubble uh, when it burst back in 2000, when they took off, um, you know, you make a ton of money on them. And then of course you, you want to just trade them always, but reality is we're coming up to one of these good pockets where I think Newmont and all these companies will do very well late this year, maybe next year. And they'll have many years of, of strong gains, but these windows only pop up like once every five, eight, 10 years or so. And you, during those times when they're out of favor, you need to go find something different to make money or else you end up with just holding on to a lot of companies that do absolutely nothing and really just burn our time, our most valuable asset. You're, you're just burning time, not making any money, uh, which is really uh, what we do not want to do. Okay. Okay. So you, you could see when, when the uh, uh, gold market uh, does take off, uh, this should do quite well, but but your time window for these is once a decade, and you have to time it perfectly. Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll see that eventually. We'll see gold break out. We'll see gold miners. I mean, gold miners and silver miners are all down at a fairly significant support level, and we're actually in the phase right now where gold, silver, and miners could actually post some pretty decent moves to the upside going into May. We tend to see them do really well just before the stock market goes off a cliff and, and good starts a bear market. So they're at support, they're oversold, they're like the most hated right now. That typically means we're probably going to see a bounce and a rally. And favorability wise, I think they might fall into favor as a strong sector. So I think we could see them run for potentially several weeks or a couple of months. I don't think it's the next big massive move, but I do think there's some upside potential from this uh, over the next few weeks to a, a couple of months. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about Barrick Gold? Yeah, Barrick Gold. I haven't looked at this in a long time. Uh, it is way back to to prices, you know, back in the '90s. Again, same same type of thing. I I can't remember if it was Barrick Gold back when gold was topping out in 2011, I think I think it was Barrick Gold. They're like one of the biggest hedges. They hedged all their positions and literally as gold was topping, they're like, we're not gonna hedge anymore because it's costing us a fortune. And they stopped hedging and then gold <laughs> went off a cliff. Uh, I mean, talk about a signature CEO move who doesn't fully understand price action and cycles. <laughs> like it's the worst thing they could have done. But um I mean, yeah, this, it's the same scenario. All gold miners, they put them in the same basket. They're all set to do probably the same thing. Just some move more than others. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on to silver. Let's bring up the silver chart. All right. So silver is, uh, it's nowhere near the highs like gold because gold is really seen more as a, I think, a long-term hold. So it holds its value more. Silver, people actively trade it more. It's, it's easy. It's volatile, so it can pull back. It's it's definitely trades more of between fear, FOMO, and and fear and greed, and it's it's very volatile. But it has built a launch pad, and at some point, we're probably going to see this <clears throat> take off and rocket higher. And percentage wise, it will most likely outperform gold dramatically. Um, but it is a volatile beast in the process. For example. Gold is near all time highs and silver is still down roughly about 55%. So yeah. um, again, there's times when you want to own them, which are these, you know, coming out of the 2000 move, you got huge rallies to the upside after the tech or the financial crisis, there was a huge move. These big upward cycles you want to be involved in, but then you really want to wait for this new cycle to take place, which I believe we're like within the one year window, I think this cycle is going to start where, we could see these really take off. But if we have a bear market, silver will most likely get pulled back, uh, pulled uh, pulled down dramatically. Last time in the financial crisis, it pulled back, back about 60%. So even if silver does rally, which silver could post rally back up to about $30 an ounce if mm -hmm. we get a strong move going into May, but it could very easily pull right back down into this range and correct 
whatever gains it makes in this short period. So, you know, I think gold and silver, I don't think there's a ton of downside from here. I think it's going to be a wild ride. There could be a rally and a sell-off before we start a big move, but uh, silver, obviously everyone loves silver because percentage wise, when it starts to rally, man, this thing, it just takes off. And yeah, with the whole can... tech space, I mean, silver is the best conductor there is out there for electricity. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's got its role. Yeah. I, I mean, if it gets really expensive, it won't play that role very much, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What uh, do you see any kind of uh, trend line? If you go from uh, the bottom of 2020, the, the COVID crash, and then just string a trend line up to where we are now. Um, do you, uh, uh, do you pay attention to anything like that or not really? Uh, I, I, I used to, I'll draw them occasionally, but, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a, you know, this, this, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of trend lines cause so many people follow them. And like, for example, you could argue there's a trend line, you know, across these lows and then the market, you know, pierces through it. Silver, silver is a beast. Silver loves to make higher highs and lower lows. It, it, it loves to throw you off. It is volatile and choppy. Uh, you know, this, you could argue, this is a very nice big cycle. This is a big downward rounding bottom. So these are definitely significant lows. Mm -hmm. If silver was to run into this support line, I wouldn't be surprised if it finds a bid and people start accumulating it. But I'm not a huge fan of uh, of trend lines so much anymore. I don't really draw them. I'll I'll use them to to get a gauge for for a level, but I find the market likes to break trend lines uh, and, and, and play games. So it is a pretty difficult. Um, silver is harder than them all. Uh, silver, <laughs> I typically don't short-term trade at all just because this type of price action is uh, difficult. <laughs> okay. 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 You like the charts a little bit more like the DXY that you're like, okay, yeah, I like we're, we're going to make 15% over the next uh, six months. And yeah, exactly. I'm an ETF trader. I like, I like to trade a basket of something and I like to know if the tide is going up or down and I get on it. Uh, I, I, when the time comes, I will be getting into gold miners like, and silver miners, like micro caps, penny stocks, if there are any left, uh, because I've had a good experience in the past, but once the, I got to let the perfect storm brew, and I will get volatile and aggressive with some of those plays because it is a lifetime, uh, life changing opportunity when that time comes. But uh, right now, I, I just like the slow moving uh, big waves in the market. OK, OK. All right. And Learn wants to know about Pan American Silver. Do you see anything on um, on that chart? All right. I see a downtrend. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's getting down into some pretty major support levels. I think, uh, you know, it, it might still want to go down towards that $11, $10 area, but in a very strong downtrend, again, there's, there's not a whole lot of favor. Let's just zoom in on, you know, we'll go over here. This is the type of price action I like to look for, for a bottom. So I like to, to see something start to go off into a waterfall sell-off. Yeah. And I, I, these waterfall sell-offs I find usually are fairly signature of a significant bottom, not, not just like a bounce that fizz, fizz, fizzles out, but a significant bottom that has like a, a massive rally after it. So let's just take a look. Uh, so we're not quite into a waterfall sell-off just yet. Uh, waterfall sell-offs have a little bit more of a fluid, you know, just kind of pouring over things where this is still jagged with pops and drops and gaps. Yeah. Uh, once you get into this fluid sell-off, that's usually when you get a really strong move. Okay. Um, okay. So that's kind of what I'd be looking at. Again, it's, it's, you're, it's bottom picking here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I'm not a fan of picking bottoms or tops, but uh, gold miners in general are getting pretty oversold. There might be a little bit more downside that uh, sometimes some of the biggest moves percentage wise happen right at the end. So we could have like a few more days of very sharp percentage drop. And then it has a knee jerk reaction bounce and, and bottom. I'd be looking for that waterfall sell off. Um, if you're an aggressive trader trying to pick a bottom, those are usually a good, a good bet, uh, more or less to, to try and get in at a low price. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. How about the ETF S I L J the junior, silver miner etf all right everybody loves the precious metal space we yes. just have to wait we just have to <laughs> wait guys. everyone we're, watching this show we're so close but we're not there yet uh, again down at support in a downtrend 
uh, he is volatile. I mean, it's, it's that support. If it breaks here, it, it could really flush down and, and push, push down to that $6 level. It's got quite a bit of downside potential still. Um, yeah, they're all of them are pretty much the same. They're kind of getting oversold. They're down at support. And um, there's going to be a time where these things shine, but we're just not there yet. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to uranium. Um, Rando Box wants to know, he says, uh, what is Chris's opinion on doing technical analysis on things like uranium spot price? The utilities don't really care about the price. So should technical analysis even matter? I, th I think you try, you, I don't know. I don't have spot on my platform. So I kind of pulled it up here on the, the Camco site. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think you follow, you trade whatever you're following. So I wouldn't trade uranium stocks based on the underlying commodity. Okay. I would trade uranium stocks based on the uranium chart price because okay. uh, generally you you want to trade, analyze what you're trading. You, you know, if you're, if you're trading the futures market, you trade the futures. So obviously there's been a huge move up here. It's gone ballistic. Um, it's pretty wild, this rally that we've seen. But you, yeah, I wouldn't focus in on the underlying spot price. Uh, I would focus in on the charts and, uh, Really, when we look at these stocks, it is showing signs that uranium stocks are are looking to top out. I think Camco shares it's themselves have just hit like a major high from 2006 or something like that. Yeah. It's got a massive double top. We do have lots of selling volume. Uh, the fact that we've got these big gaps to the upside and then sell-offs and a big gap up and a big sell-off, this type of volatility is usually indicative of a top. Usually we get into this really noisy and then the market fizzles out for a while. So I kind of feel like um, I think most of the upside is done for now. I do think when you look at this chart long term, I think uranium is going to become one of those plays. They could be an unbelievable play. Right now, that's building a giant stage one base, or you could say it's a big cup and handle. Yeah. Um, but it's building a launch pad. I do think it'll pull back with the markets and consolidate. But I am actually pretty excited to see uh, a breakout and rally when a new bull market starts, uranium could be the play because everybody's trying to move towards climate and uh, low carbon emissions. Uranium is like the power source to do that. And we can do it very safely with the technology we have now. So um, that, that I think that time is going to come and these, these little companies could skyrocket uh, simply because I think Sprott bought up all the all the uranium available and China's got all the use. They're going back with uranium powered, I don't know, subs or something like that military. And they're keeping all their uranium. So there is a perfect storm brewing here. And I think we've seen early investors move in They're positioned in it. Hence the big rally off the lows back in 2020. But um, I still think there's a lot of room above uh, in due time. Okay. Okay. Not just yet. We need, we need this to, uh, kind of fizzle out a little bit like it did before. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And let's move on to oil. All right. All right. Taking a look at oil. If we kind of zoom out of the big picture of oil and let's just get rid of that negative price. In, in reality, oil is really kind of trading right in the middle of its range. If we take some of these lows here, we take a couple of these highs up here oil is pretty much trading smack dab in the middle. There's not a whole lot of insight here. I, I feel like it's got a downdraft. It, it did put in a little bit of a double top here. Mm -hmm. And now we're kind of in this, this consolidation phase, which a consolidation means it's just a pause before continuing the trend to the downside. So if the trend was down into the consolidation, eventually this should end up going down. And I have about a $40 uh, downside target on oil I don't know when it's going to happen, but I feel like that'll be the next major pivot point. And oil, it seems cheap for oil, but we have hit $40 oil many, many times over the past 20 years. And uh, usually it's during some type of um, massive correction, whether it's a tech bubble, whoops, and the economy bottoms out, or it's a financial crisis, or it's just tough economical times, or it's COVID. When there's fear in the market, things sell off. And that's where I see oil probably heading once we get through this AI and NVIDIA, everybody needs to own it. A uh, little bubble phase of the markets um, kind of push the indexes are pushing higher because of the tech. 
Okay. Okay. You know, I've wondered about that with uh, um, oil and natural gas, if that's one of the reasons that we haven't officially hit a uh, recession yet is because oil and natural gas are so cheap. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Energy drives an economy. And if your energy is, uh, is dirt cheap, you can afford to still do a lot of stuff, you know? Oh, I know. I, I cannot afford you cannot believe the price of natural gas considering like i think russia cut off like you know europe right i mean how are how is our how is the gas not jacked up and they're like liquefying it and sending it over maybe they are i don't follow the space but man like natural gas is is so cheap and we do have these like big cycles in natural gas that happen like every three four years we've got these big big cycles that just keep unfolding and we've just gone through one of these big big blow off phases. So, you know, I think natural gas will be working itself into an oversold condition and it'll go back into another big bounce phase. And, and believe it or not, sometimes we actually see natural gas um, uh, buck the trend. Stock market can sell off, natural gas can go up. But uh, yeah, we have super cheap energy pricing and natural gas is like at giveaway pricing. Like it's not even worth probably mining the stuff. <laughs> it you know there's a big arbitrage too one of the companies we follow devon they they they're able to pull it out of the ground and ship it off to japan for about three bucks a million btus but japan right. is buying it at eight or nine dollars and so there's a huge arbitrage right there you know even though technically when you look at this a dollar 64 they're losing yeah, yeah. money on it but as long as you find the right customer uh they're 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 making a pile Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But in Europe, it, natural gas is so expensive. Though though yeah. 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 Now, how would you play this if, if in an ETF? Would you do like NGL or no, I wouldn't touch it. I mean, there's I don't think there is a good ETF for natural gas. If okay. you hold it long enough, you're bound to lose money. Yeah. Even if it goes up, you you still don't make like you really have to time natural gas. So I would wait until it's in a really strong uptrend. I mean, we got a nice bullish, bullish chart pattern with a nice bull flag on the daily chart or something. If you're a swing trader, I'd be like looking to move into it then. But right now, trying to pick a bottom and wait, to me, that is uh, very difficult. The, there's just the contango, the ETFs just lose value um, as contracts roll and things like that. So that's the problem with natural gas. There's some amazing moves, but there aren't really very good ways to trade it. Um, and, and this, I always found this frustrating. I'm like, oh, natural gas is a great play. And all I got to do is buy it here and sit on, you know, UNG and I'll be, I'll be golden, but you know, it rallies up 30, 40% UNG just moves back to break even. You're like, wow. I mean, these things are built so poorly. Uh, I find it amazing that the financial system allows, you know, such terrible things to be built and offered to retail people, but <laughs> that's a different I, story. I, I noticed the same thing. There's a, it'll have a huge uh, blow off top and these ETFs do absolutely nothing. And yeah. it, is there just, uh, I don't know if the management fee is way too high or, or what the heck is going on, but no, it, it, it's called, it's called contango. So they're, 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 they're rotating money every day to a, a forward running contract and there is a man big management fee and just this whole way of of rolling to future future contracts are always valued less because yeah. you now have more time to make money so they anyway long story short because they're constantly rolling you forward into the next contract and the next day you know a whole bunch more gets rolled it's buying into a lower price natural gas so it's constantly just moving the price down i think that's roughly how it works i mean um, I don't know it in detail, but it's just, it's called Contango and UNG is a great way to lose a lot of money. Even if the natural gas goes sideways or up, you can still lose money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, Nada wants to know about Bitcoin, R-I-O-T. Oh, well, yeah. Let's start with uh, Bitcoin first and then we'll, we'll move on. Sure. To yeah. Okay. So Bitcoin's definitely back up in, in, in bullish territory. It has put in a big, you know, stage one, a rounding bottom formation. It, it broke out of that. Uh, this was a, a pretty major, major level. And of course, so now it's in bull market territory. It's ripping higher. It feels a, a little long in the teeth. I think it could have a little bit more of a pause or pullback. Uh, we can see it taking a little bit of a pause here. We got a high right here. We got a breakdown and gap. We got a breakout. We got a high. We got some pivot lows and a lot through here. So this is definitely a little bit of an inflection point. A little tipping point here uh, but overall i mean it's in an uptrend this could very easily the next upside i think push here will be around sixty thousand. 
just because there's a little cluster of, of days through here. There's a pivot low. Um, there's a, a couple days through here. So 60,000 is definitely a level where there's going to be some sellers lurking. It's also a whole number. People tend to be like, well, if it hits 60,000, I'll sell some of my shares. Yeah. It's just the way people work. Um, so I'm bullish on it. I mean, it looks like it's going to go to 60,000 and it could keep going beyond that, but the next stop here will probably be 60,000. Okay. Okay. And he wanted, he wanted riot or something like that. The, uh, let's say, pull that up real quick. I don't know what this is. Obviously it's some type of platform, um, but it has, it's building a base. We can draw a line right across here. So this is like a rounding formation, a, a stage one, a basing. It's kind of building a launch pad. Uh, if it can break out of here, then it should have a half decent move. Uh, you know, we can just take the height of this and we can stack it on here. And if it was to break out, this will probably bring us somewhere up to that next resistance level, which happens to be all of these highs and these pivot lows through here. So, oh, that lines you know, up perfectly. I always look at uh, the stock market or charts. I'll sometimes I'll, I'll draw a whole bunch of them, and literally you just look at each one like a floor and a ceiling on a apartment building. And more or less, you're you're naturally going to like stand on one floor. When you break through a ceiling, you're going to usually go up to the next ceiling and then bounce around for a bit. And uh, so if you look at it as layers, it's just the market yeah. works its way up the apartment building. Huh. That's cool. Yeah. And and that uh, that move up to 36 or 38 or whatever it is lines up with a lot of uh, uh, price action back in. It 20. does. Yeah. That looks like uh, it would be a, a level where there's going to be some sellers stepping in, but uh, there's definitely a lot of momentum uh, building up through this. The yeah. longer something trades sideways and this, this big range it's in definitely gives it a lot of power. If it breaks out, it can have a pretty decent run. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Chris. This was a lot of fun. Um, if, uh, if uh, one of our uh, listeners wants to uh, sign up for your service, what can they expect? Sure. Yeah. Well, pretty much what you and I just did. I go through the charts every morning around eight 30 uh, so you kickstart the day with your coffee and I run through the charts of all the different markets, how they're relating to each other, our positions. Uh, I, I share all my ETF trades that I do so you can copy what I do and uh, they can do that at the, thetechnicaltraders.com and go from there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. There will be a link uh, down in the pinned comment below. It's an affiliate link. It doesn't cost you any extra and you support your favorite podcast in the process. Chris, thank you very much for coming back on the show. Hey, it's a pleasure, Steve. Take care. Talk to you next time. Yes, and thank you for tuning in. Hit the like and subscribe and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about NVIDIA. You have yourself a great rest of the day and we will talk to you next time.